Hallelujah. Just lift up your hands and, and just worship the Lord. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you because you have blessed us and we're going to hear your word and you're going to empower us for more things today. Thank you, Lord God, for what you've started in this place. Fill our hearts with a passion for you. Open our hearts to hear your words and let us be transformed in your presence today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. First, as a country, I want to bring something up. We are facing a very difficult time with the civil unrest going on. This is not a political game. It's not a political position. It's not political position. It's not whether you're left or you're right. Um, this is identifying a systemic issue and facing it head on, head on and addressing it. And that issue is the issue of racism and, and brutality with the people of color and other minorities. It is a, a real issue that should not be swept under the carpet, whether in the church or everywhere else. Companies are stepping out the stage to really speak their heart about it. Um, and maybe, like I said on Wednesday, some of you may have faced some things like that. And this is, a, this is an opportunity for us to um, step out and be a part of a solution. We all have biases um, we need to be able to sit at the table and have these discussions, even though it might be uncomfortable. Um, they're needed to, to move on as a, company, as a country, to move together in unity. That, that discussion, those discussions are needed. We need to check each of ourselves, even us, even people of color, we need to check each of ourselves because, and ask yourself, do you have biases as well? Do you have biases with the Chinese? Do you have biases with Puerto Ricans? Do you have biases with Hispanics? We need to ask ourselves, are we, are we, do we have biases ourselves, right? We need to check ourselves and be aware of these biases and deal with them and grow from them. While the country is protesting and, and going through this protest and things, there's another part of this I would like to talk about. And that's a part where I have as questions. How can we continue to develop ourselves as minorities, as African Americans? How can we position ourselves to be above this? How can we position ourselves to not be a part of a system, not perpetuate the perception? I know it's not individual, so we're not the cause of it, but I'm asking our question, how can we help ourselves be better? It's not, it's not a fault of us because, it, you understand what I'm saying? It's not a fault, but I'm saying now, yes, where we are. How can we be a part of a solution? Um, how can we continue to develop ourselves as African Americans? How do we need to start? What do we need to start to do differently? I don't have all the answers and I don't claim to know it, but I only want to bring awareness to a critical one. You and I have the power and control over today. And that part is a part of our own home. Our home is where the next generations are shaped, whether it's white or black, Hispanics, Indians, Puerto Ricans, Jamaicans. Our homes are where we develop, where we are taught, where we are thought about the ideals, the hold, and the ideals about the society. Now, my question to you is: What is your home like today? What are you perpetuating? today what about the idea what, what what types of products are coming out of our homes and particularly your own home my own home i need to ask myself cola is my own home adding to this situation is it influencing the society is it fueling the flame is it creating a better generation who will be politicians who will stand up for the truth in love who will be an agent of change, having the right conversation. Is my home a winning home? How about yours? Is your home a winning home? Frankly, there are many times I feel like I'm not doing the best I could do. There are sometimes I feel like I'm failing at it. Sometimes I feel like I am not getting it right. And I'm standing here honest and putting the thing forward and just laying it down. So that all of us can also check ourselves individually. Have you looked back at yourself and said, what am I doing to either add or to solve? And sometimes I have to ask myself, am I raising children 
that will make an impact in the future. Am I raising the next president? Am I raising the next president that will stand up for the truth? And when I feel God has continued help, continually helped me and reminded me about leaning on Him, I also learned through this, and I hope you do too. Maybe you're like me, having a feeling that you could do better, and you haven't been the best at it, or you haven't been, you haven't been so great at it. Well, you would learn from this series we're about to start. So stay tuned and don't miss any part of it. And the first the series is titled, The Winning Home. Let's go to Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18. The winning home. Genesis chapter 18. What is your home front like? I usually tell people, I mean, we talk about how there's racism and there's certain words they cannot call an African American because it's derogatory. Do you use other words for other people? You want equality. You must be able to give it. Do you call certain other races something else? You don't have to be white to have the bias in your mind. We're all part of this, and we all need to be part of a solution. Use them. If it's black, say black. If it's white, say white. If it's Chinese, say Chinese. Don't start to give different names for different people just because it's, it's, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And I want you to understand this is not whether it's because it's a Republican governor or president or whether it's a Democrat. This is the world we're in today and we need to stand up for what is true. We need to stand up for justice and truth. But listen, before we point that finger up, the Bible says remove the slug in your own eye before you try to remove a speck in another person's eye. Before we point the finger over, which I think is a great thing that we're raising awareness about this and we're fighting for what's right. But we also need to taste, have a self moment and say, am I part of a solution or am I part of a problem? It may not be because I'm not white. See, I'm proud of my African roots. I'm proud of my African roots. Uh, uh, and I just have to be the best of myself as an African. I should not be stereotyped. <laughs> I should not be uh, um, uh, discriminated against. I'm a best of myself, and every day I have to work towards being the best of myself. We're getting there. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. I'd like for us to read it together. One, two, go. For I have known him, talking about Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his what? Household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do what? Righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him, the winning home. The winning home. The winning home. Now I'll give you go through a series of definition of what I mean by the winning home. Number one, the winning home is a branch of God's kingdom where his commands are obeyed and the benefits of his kingdom are enjoyed. Now, if you look at Abraham here, the Bible says that at the end it said, I will bring to Abraham what I promised him. Why? Because Abraham was cultivating, was developing a winning home. God says, I know of my son Abraham, he will teach his children. Is that the way God sees us in our home today? Is God believing that we're teaching our children or are we making our own desires priority or are we looking at the children? Are we, are we building the children? Are we, are, we, are we showing and carrying the ways of God, the commandments of God? Is it being passed on to the next generation? Can God trust that I'm giving you a word and your child will be blessed with a word? And so Abraham in this case said, I've got to teach my children. And he wasn't telling God, but God just trusted that Abraham will do that. And the Bible says he will bring him everything that he promised him. In the book of Job chapter 36, go with me there, book Job chapter 36. Job is right before Psalms. I want to read verse 11. It says, If they obey him and serve him, they shall spend their, year, their days in prosperity. 
and their years in pleasures. Read verse 12. I don't want to just talk about the good things. Let's talk about the reality. But if they do not obey, they will perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge. That's not your portion, but it's in the Bible. So it's fair game for us to read it. Okay? Let's not get the good ones and not talk about the reality. Okay? These are difficult conversations, but we have to have them. Um, in the book of Matthew chapter 18, and, and, and Matthew chapter 18, you see the Bible talks about where two or three are guarded in the, in, in the midst. The Bible says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I think that's, you know, chapter 18 talks about where two or three are guarded in my name. Can you go there, go there for me? 18 verse, 9, verse 18, Matthew 18, 18. I think 16, 19 talks about, yes, I surely said to you, whatever, that's all, that was, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. And verse 19 says, again, I said to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father. Now go with me. You just read that part. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. You'll realize that Jesus was talking to Peter and it said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Yes, God telling Peter, God, Jesus telling Peter, I'm giving the keys of heaven. So the keys of heaven is predicated. The keys of heaven, one of the things about the keys of heaven it means it allows us to bind and lose. Yeah, the keys of the kingdom. Which means whatever we bind, will be bound. Whatever we lose, will be loose. Now let's go to verse, chapter 18, verse 18. Let's read that again. Okay, chapter 13, verse 18. It says, I surely I said to you, whatever you bind on earth. Now, we now have the keys. This is chapter 18, right? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse 19 now says, now how are we going to do that? It says, again I said to you, that if two of you shall agree concerning one thing, it shall be done on, on earth. So we are able, remember when I said something last, last, last month, we were talking about recovery, and I said one is good, two is better, but two working together is what? Explosive. Remember I said that? This is what the scripture is saying here. It says, look, if two of you shall agree, and the Bible says, shall two work together, I don't want to move too fast here, but shall two work together, Amos chapter 3 verse 3, except they be agreed on direction. And the Bible now says, listen, it says, if you, two of you shall agree concerning something on earth, it will be done for them by my Father. And it says, if you bind on earth, it will be done. So God is responding when we agree. And we agree concerning something. Why? Because the keys of the kingdom have been given to us. So our effectivity as believers predicates upon agreement and having God in the middle and speaking Using the understanding of the keys of keys of kingdom, the keys of, of the kingdom, which was speaking, knowing that whatever I bind on head, earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever I lose will also be loose. You understand what I'm saying? Did I lose you there or did I get you? You good? Good. In other words, where is the best place where you have the biggest agreement? If you look at our it's not the country, because the country is there's left and right. It's not the city because it's left and right. The place where you have the biggest agreement is the home. In other words, even though we look at the home as just the home, the home is the most powerful place where the presence and the power of God needs to start at. It says if two of you shall agree concerning something, it will be done unto you. So the home is a place where the presence of God needs to start, where your binding needs to start. So if you at home can agree concerning something, the Bible says, Jesus, God says, I'm there. And God says, because of the keys of the kingdom I've given to you, you will bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven. You will lose on earth, it will be lose in heaven. In other words, God says, I'm giving you carte blanche. I'm giving you access to heaven if you will build a winning home and that winning home is a home that can come together and benefit out of what this is hallelujah the thing about home is you don't need to travel you don't have to meet someone at starbucks you don't have it's just the home funny thing is god says i'm going to come into the home because you two or three are gathered in my name two the winning home is the embassy of heaven on earth exempted from the influence of the reign influence and the reign of satan let me say again, the winning home is the embassy of heaven on earth. Now, why is this important? When in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and, and if you realize, and in, in from 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, work with me. Okay, I'll just go old fashioned way. 
from 26, says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the, over the cattle, over the, the, all the earth, and every creeping thing that, it, that creeps on it. And then the Bible says in verse 27, So God created man in his own image, and the image in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. Then the Bible says, Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. In other words, God said, I'm going to create you just like me. And so when we create you just like me, you have everything I've got. You can say what you want to say. You can speak things out. Yesterday, my daughter was talking to me about the power of the tongue. And she said they had this experiments that they did. This guy did experiments. She was reading a book that mom gave her. And this one person planted three plants. And then she said that this one said she did nothing about that one. And this other plant spoke neg good things about it. And this other plant spoke, spoke negative things about it. This one, nothing really spectacular. This one that spoke good things about it began to grow better than the ones that spoke. The one that spoke negative went down. She now said, how does this work? Is it that God just said, oh, they started speaking. Okay, you plants, don't grow. And she was asking the question. I thought that was a very good question. That why is it that the one that they spoke the positive things happened, that it was, it was blooming, it was blossoming. And I said, because we, when we are like Christians, when we as believers, the Bible says, and for ye are gods. Don't you know you're, ye are gods and the sons of the most high. We are created in God's image. And when God said, I said, it's the same thing that happened when God spoke and said, let there be light. I said, it's not that somebody just came back and it said, when they said, let there be light, the world began to, the earth began to shape and remove and, uh, and align itself with the spoken word of God. Light began to appear. And that's why you've heard this over and over again, that a closed mouth is a closed destiny. The Bible says a man shall be satisfied by the fruit of his lips. Life and death and the power of a tongue and those that love it will eat of his fruit thereof. In other words, and I told her, I said, listen, when they started speaking, here's what I think happened. Because the person was a believer and because God has put, he said it's built into the fabric of earth like seed and harvest. You don't plant a seed and hope harvest comes. It's already built into fabric of, of, of what it takes for this world to run. And so what we see is the physical things, but what we don't see is the spiritual things. And what controls the spiritual things are spiritual things. The Bible says they don't obey the things of natural in Romans chapter 8. So spiritual things allow you to speak spiritual things and they just have no choice but to manifest physically. When God spoke the word, he spoke it as God, but the reality happened and there was. It became physical. So in other words, everything we say, when we have to understand this, and, and when we see impact of it is because we know that God is with us. We know that we're children of God. And if we know that we're children of God, and we know that, that, that when God created heaven, he put that power, he made us just like him, so that we shall decree a thing and it shall be established. Are you with me? That's God's purpose for us. That's God's plan from the get-go. Now here's the thing. He now, men fell and lost that authority. And then what happens? Jesus came and redeemed us. Now we have the authority. But when God created the art and like it happened with Abraham, when he started to give a form of salvation by, 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 by calling Abraham by faith, um, Abraham could get the same result as what God expected us to get at the beginning. Which means Abraham was able to raise his kids, Abraham was able to believe God, and God called him his friend. And because of that, we as believers now that have been redeemed also are, have to look at our homes as an embassy of heaven. Listen, the United States is here. There's protest going on here. What I heard again is the fact that in other countries, they decided to go to the embassy and start protesting. The land where that country, where that embassy resides in that country is the United States. And if you attack that place, it's like you're throwing bombs into the United States. That's the power of an embassy. 
which means the laws that apply and the enjoyment that are happening in the country, it's happening also at the embassy. As a matter of fact, you cannot stop an, a, a diplomatic car. It's called what is called diplomatic immunity. As long as they do, if, even if they break laws and break laws and whatnot, they will say we'll deal with it, especially United States, we'll deal with it in our own place. They might send you back to the United States, that's okay, but we'll deal with it. You don't get to put our people in prison because, just because they broke, that's okay. He has diplomatic immunity. You have no idea what it means to have, you can go in a place and, and so I was talking to a friend here who was telling me how um, they were bringing people during the, 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 the pandemic. Americans went to different countries and started bringing people in. And so these people were spread apart in different parts of the country, especially in, in, in Nigeria is one of the example. And this, and I was saying, how did they get these people in? And he was explaining to me that, that they sent something on the email saying, this person's got diplomatic immunity. Now, upon all that blockades that were in different parts of the country that you cannot pass from one state to another, all you have to do is, mm -hmm. and if you stick it to your hand and type it, you can say, mm, talk to the hand. And at that point, they look at the diplomatic immunity and they just can't stop you. They just say, keep going. That is a power of diplomatic immunity. Why? Because they know they're taking to embassy so they can get a plane and fly back here. What I'm saying here is this. You have to look at your home as an embassy of heaven. You have to understand that what's happening in heaven, God has given you authority to enjoy the same thing here on earth. If you look at your home as just a regular home, then you don't enjoy the power of a winning home. To enjoy the power of a winning home, you have to look at the home as a place, as heaven on earth. You're not going to get in the society. We're not getting the society. We're not getting it in the country, but we're getting it in our home. The home is where you have the utmost control. It's a place where the presence of God can stay and nobody can question you. It's a place where you can experience the power of God and nobody can say, what are you doing here? You, cannot, you may not be able to go to your work and talk about Jesus, but you can talk about it at your home. So if you have the leeway to talk about Jesus at your home, to develop Jesus, the, the relationship at home, why aren't we doing that? Hallelujah. Number three, the winning home is a breeding ground of, for, of godly seeds that will bruise the head of Satan. Now, a lot of us are Christians and we're believers and we're, we're, we're older people and, and, and we have kids at home. My question, like I said earlier, is are we, are we raising godly kids that will speak with the authority of a believer? Are you challenging your children? Are you teaching them the authority they have in Christ Jesus? You know, it took you a long time as believers to know it, but is it better if you start teaching them at a young age that this is your authority in Christ Jesus? Because whatever you teach here is what they're going to take over to their own families. It's what they're going to take over to the society. When the society hey, let's, let's join them and do something wrong. They have a foundation to stand on to say, I know what you want to do. I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not going to do that. I want the same result, but there's a better way to do it. When the society says, let's go ahead and, and this is what is the norm, what's allowed in the society. You want your children to be able to stand up and say, no. When the enemy comes in and says, you know what, I, I'm, I, I'm going to put you on the sickness. You want your children to be able to stand up and say, and say I have a bomb in Gilead, a God who heals. And so I'm not one who will be subjected to your meandering and your bamboozing, devil. Because the Bible says in, in, in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The devil might kind of get you. Oh, he would, he would come in. But you see, when he comes in, the Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, I have given you authority to trample over snakes and scorpion and all the power of the enemy, and they will not by any means hurt you. That is a believer's belief. That is what we need to let our kids know, that the devil cannot get you. And the knowledge of that allows us not only to build the home we have today, but we're also building what? Future generation homes. Let me ask you a question. And I'll ask the question over and over again. Is that the home we're building today? Somebody say the winning home. Number four. The winning home is an institution created by God 
where love is lived and love is shared. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7. The Bible says concerning love, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, its own, not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. The winning home is an institution created by God where love is lived, love is shared. You see, it's a place of laughter. It's a place where laughter is shared, where support is given, kindness, tenderness, genuine care. A place of safety for everyone and no judgment. We need to cultivate a room, a home where every member of a home feels like they're part of a society that does not judge. If your wife, you know, you hear the story, I thank God for my husband who helped me through this. I thank God for my husband when I went through this. I thank God for this. I thank God for that. Um, for my husband and for my home and what's going on in there. Or I thank God for my wife. You heard these things over and over again. What profit, what kind of man is a man that wants to be the Lord and doesn't want his wife to succeed? That's not a man creating a winning home. And sometimes a man has got to take a back seat and say, wife, you go ahead and pursue. You see, that's the thing I'll bring up again. If we want justice and equality and we don't want our wives to be the best of themselves, let me say it clearly, it's hypocrisy. If you want justice and equality and you don't want a kid to be the best of themselves, it's hypocrisy. If your wife is going to be better than you and make more money than you, and that is what God called her to do, please let her be that. The Bible says love does not envy. It's kind. Don't make her feel different. And women, just because you now have five more degrees than your husband. Don't go start right on, uh huh. Your, your spin is different. The way you walk at home becomes different. You have to make him still feel secure, feel secure as a man. Don't emasculate men. Don't, because, because you earn money does not mean you wear pants. Okay, okay. That came out too quick. Just because you earn my money doesn't mean you're the one wearing the pants or you've taken the role of the husband at home. You now make call the shots. Well, you know, I got the money. Yeah, we need to do that one. But in the past, he's always done that. You know, the women I really respect, according to scripture, is when they take the money and they know they earn the money, but feel secure enough. Again, this is what the winning home. You feel secure enough to say, hey, husband, here's the money I made. I'm sure God has given you a gift for us. So God has told you exactly what we want to do about this. And so let's go ahead and... You let me know what we need to do about it. You see, I know that's contradictory, but let me tell you this. That's, that's contrary to what people say, but let me tell you exactly this. And I'm, you're going to hear me talk about this. The home that's going to win has got to do things according to the way of God, not according to the society. A winning home will always do. To win, you have to be a home that does things according to the way of God. God's ways about how he created man and women and marriage is not something that you can dispute you all you want, and I'm okay with you disputing but it doesn't remove the fact that it's God's way and it works when done well. And let's just be honest. So I'm not here to talk about, again, not to society. This I'm talking about a winning home. And a winning home starts with a home and people who are willing to work together to obey God's word, to fulfill their purpose on earth. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Number what? Did you get that? Was that clear? Uh, it must be a place of safety for everyone. It must be no judgment. You know, when I talked about winning home and my wife saw my message, she goes, oh, she's in trouble. I only married one wife. I can only have one example. 
I'm unfortunate there's only one example I can give. <laughs> so I'll, I don't even remember the example again, so that's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, so it's a place with no judgment. Oh, I remember it now. I, I was, I remember it. So uh, the thing about that is that she, um, kids and I want to do a lot of fun things and we're very, let's just go out and outdoors and do that. My wife is not already, is not the greatest outdoor. She's got a gift, but not outdoors. And so we're like, oh, daddy, kids, are we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to get that one. We're going to do that one. Um, and we're going to do all that stuff. And then my wife felt left out, right? And so in the spirit of let's not create judgment, we were just like, okay. My wife was like, well, you know, you all just go do it. I'll be there. Even if I cannot join you, I'll be there. So that just created some inclusive, inclusivity. I'm like, yeah, babe, you, you're going to do that. Yeah, inclusive and diversity. Yes, come around. Uh, we'll, we'll support you. She goes, I may not participate in that place, but I would, I would join. I said, yeah, 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 just come in. And I know what that means. That means if we're on the grass, we have to claim my wife's area. There must be no, nothing to really. <laughs> I love you still. <laughs> Glory to God. Um, but here's the point I'm saying. You cannot judge because somebody does not fit the way. Again, if you cannot find that home that does that, what is society doing? Hallelujah. Number. A winning home is where the word of God is impressed, taught, and learned as a center of all they stand for and stand with. Is where the word is impressed, is taught and learned as a center of all they stand for and stand with. Questions, are you pressing in on the word of God in your home? Is God the center of it all? When decisions go and husband and wife make different, they're like, I want that one, you want that one. It happens in every home. What becomes the center of your decision? You then say, okay, listen, what does the word of God say? And let me be clear about this. Anyone can use the word of God to twist position to favor them. Please, let's be honest about that. <laughs> yeah. So we have to, that's where you have to be honest about it. You have to do it out of love and say, we want the best for one another. What does the word of God say about us? There's some things that, that might not be clear in the word. We wanted to know what decision we didn't make about kids. She was in a private school, we're going to put in public school, and just moved in to a different place, and we're going to put a public school, and it was a much better school. And my wife wanted a public school, private school, and now in public school. So we sat down and decided, I said, go pray about it, we'll pray about it. We came back. We're still uh, uh, we're about what we felt. And so, okay, why don't we come back and reconvene? And so we came back and we did a SWOT analysis and said, here's why, here's what I believe, here's why I said, I listened to what she said. By the time we finished it, we were like, okay, what do we think God wants us to do? And we sat down and said, okay, here's what we need to do. We came out after a discussion that this is what God wants us to do. And so we ran into that and, and finally got that way. <laughs> Um, and if semester into it, my wife came back and she said, you know what, I, I believe this was the right decision with me. I believe this is exactly what God wants to do um, there. Do you have a home where the final decision is about what is God saying? Or is your home about, you know, I'm the man. The box stops here. I know where we're going. I need to get there. That's not the way God called marriage. You want to make sure that your kids know where to go to as they grow on when things are not clear. Sometimes you understand why is this a winning home because sometimes it's not about you. A lot of times it's about how you're making impact on the family. How would your child know what to look for when they're in college and they have to make a decision? When they want to know where to go to college? When they want to know what to study? Now they've prayed they have so many gifts, now you're confused. They have different paths they can take. Now you're confused. They accepted them in 17 different colleges. Now you're like, which one should I go to? But to be able to help your children understand that this is how we make decisions. After everything said and done, it's God that's there. And what God says, this is, yes, one thing happened. When you make godly decisions, God will back you up. The children will see it and know that, huh, I don't have to be told that God helps. It's evident. 
You know, first thing that happened when, when, when a woman of God told me about the, um, I shared the testimony, I just looked at her and said, man, the kids are going to be so inspired because I know the kids so very well. They're going to be so inspired to know that mom was working, mom was very, she was a choir leader, mom was, I mean, they just feel like I can do it. She was working, she was going to school, they'll feel like I can do it. Now, you throw anything at them. It's one of those things that you roll. You remember people who go and work really hard and get, do well, and they'll be thinking in their mind, how did you get this? They said, because of how they, what their parents taught them. They saw the work ethic in my parent, and that just gave them the ability to know what to do. Imagine that. Every day, every decision you're making is a decision that's, loving, that's having lasting impacts on your children. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to bring verse, chapter 6 and, and verse 6. And I want to talk about there where God, Moses had given them the laws and, and was talking about the impact of the law. Deuteronomy... What am I looking for here? Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hiding behind this thing. What am I looking for? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 to 9. The Bible says, And these words which I command you, this is the word of God, today shall be in your heart. Now, it's your own heart first, right? And because it's in your heart, guess what you're going to be able to do? <laughs> and, and, and you shall teach them. Now, it's in your heart. And you should teach them, right? You should teach them. Who are we going to teach them to? Um, you should teach them diligently to your what? Children. And shall talk of them when you what? <laughs> Where? In the community? Uh, let's read together so we can all know what I'm talking about. And, and verse, verse 6. Now, this is about us first, right? And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7 then says, And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall, when you what? Sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Verse 8. You shall what? Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. The winning home is where the word of God is all be, is be uh, all and the be it all. But you see, we've got to get that word of God first in our hearts first. And then we have to make sure we have room to be able to help our children know the word of God. Hallelujah. Now, the winning home is a home that strives to abolish hurt, abuse, pain. But where peace and love reigns. You know, Revelation chapter 21, when I read from verse 1, the scripture makes us understand that at the end of it all, when we've all been raptured, uh, and I juxtapose this with, we're kind of put back to side by side with how God sees what we're doing. Like I said, this place is an embassy, what? Of heaven. If it's an embassy of heaven, so if we are creating a winning home, what do you think God should be creating? Help me. What do you think God should be creating? I, don't, don't ask me how I'm going to prove it. Don't worry about that. All I'm asking is that if this is an embassy and we're creating a winning home, what do you think God should be creating? A winning home. And just let me show you exactly where God is doing that. Revelation chapter 21. And we'll see exactly what God is doing to create a winning home. It says, and you remember Jesus said, I go to a place to prepare what? A place, what? For you. For where I am. There you may what? also be and then what is this place the final place and verse 1 says now i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea verse 22 then i john saw the holy city on new jerusalem coming down of, of out of heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, which means he's dwelling in that place, and he will dwell what? With them, and they shall what? Be his people, and God himself will be what? Their God. Verse 4, And I will what? Wipe away every tear from the eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, nor the form, and the former things have passed away. What did I say earlier? No judgment, no pain. 
a place where you can be where the presence of the Lord is. Now, you can see where God himself is thinking, I'm going to create a winning home where my kids finish on this earth. And if it's truly an embassy, if our homes are an embassy, then our homes must be winning. We must be winning. And being winning allows us to be ready for the home that God is going to take us to. Is someone there with me? So God has promised us this home. He wants us to live it now. We have to strive for peace and love where the gifts and blessings of God can thrive. Um, where the family, where the husband is excited to come back home to, where the wife is excited to come back, remove strife. Please, please, if your home is a place where your husband does not feel like coming home, the Bible says a wise man builds her own home. A foolish one tears his apart. Okay? If your home is a place where your wife cannot come home because of abuse, stop it today. If your home is a place where your husband cannot come home because you just don't know how to keep the mouth in the right place, please stop it today. Make your home a winning home. And that's not on the city. It's not on the government. And that's the thing we have to shift in our mind. The government can produce and provide for the nation. They cannot create a winning home. It is not the government's job to create a winning home. With everything that's going on in this world, we have to understand, it must start with us. We create the winning home. The government can do that. They can change racism. It can all be equal. But if the home is not set right, we will go back there. The Bible says that, you know, we talk about you cast a demon out and seven more will go because you've done nothing. But if we do something today, create a winning home, when the world is not being preserved, when we're standing up for what's true, then what's at home begins to radiate and begins to create the next one. Make sure your family can come home, your husband can come home. The children should not be afraid at home. Except when they do something bad. (laughs) They should know that there are laws and rules. I've talked about that one. Bible says foolishness is born in the heart of a child. It's in the word of God. And so I'm not one of those who don't believe it. I believe it clearly. A rod of correction. There are times where you speak. There are times when the rod correction can drive you so far. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In reasonable terms, right? But they must be willing to come back home. If your home is a love, if your home is better than outside, your kids will always want to come back home. My desire, my prayer, and I know this is not easy and easy enough for society because our society is hijacking our children and what the children are listening to and what they get and what they think is a very good thing out there. The society is hijacking them. What do you think we have to do? We can't fight the society. Listen, you can't. Where do you want to start from? Kill the internet? <laughs> you can't start it. You can't fight it. What you've got to do is the same... God was showing me this something yesterday. He said to me, he said, why is it that a guy sitting in his office can use computer or can, he has a small lanky guy like me, gets a big guy, like the only person I know is a dear brother here, uh, who's like a big, strong, heavy guy, right? And not him now in this case, but how can small lanky guy become the boss of a cartel? And everybody does the bidding for him. I'm like, okay, he's got the money, he can't fight. And you're fighting and you're dying for the guy who's not leaving his office. How is that possible? Whether you like it or not, it's some level of leadership. I'll be honest with you, to make that, how did Hitler get a whole nation to do the wrong things? It's not the right thing. But here's the thing I want to bring out of that. Because people play on what other people desire more. How do you get a salesman to sell more? By telling him, you're going to be cut off if you don't sell more. No, incentivize him more. Tell him, the more you sell, I'll double your permission about that time. He'll go out and sell. Everyone has something that motivates them. Find those things that motivate those people. Even this big cartel, the big, the big tough people, but they go and cowl about their wives when they get back home. That's his biggest motivation. Or you don't talk about their mama. 
because then you just started something really, really, they, that's one they'll send the big guy at you. Don't talk about the mama. Everyone has what motivates them. Everyone is inspired to do something. Or some, everyone's got something that motivates them. And when you think about the society having influence on our children, what we have to do is make the home a better place than outside. Let the kids find the motivation at home. If they find hurt, pain at home, guess where they're going to go? To the place where there's peace. Is someone here with me today? Incentivize them. You cannot change the society. That's a big bad wolf. But you can change your home and make it a winning home. So no matter where your kids are, they will always remember. That's my prayer. They will always remember. No matter where I am, I can come back home. Like the prodigal son. I'm not saying that they, the life would, they would not be, they, I pray they would not be influenced the wrong way. I'm not saying they would not find their own path. They would not be lost. None of our children would be lost. Amen. And it's okay for us to pray that prayer. But it's another thing for us to create or what? Winning home. Because that winning home is where, what made the, the, this prodigal son come back home? If it was a place where he said, at least I will eat this thing. And that place is worse than where I'm coming from. Do you think he's going to go back home? No, he said, I will go to my father. And because he knew how his father treated his, uh, his servants, he said, he's treated better than if, even those people are even enjoying. So even if I go, as be, as I go back home and become a servant, I will be living the life. That's what a winning home does. You can't change the society, but you can create a winning home. Hallelujah. I am, and I want to bring this, this last point here. So don't bring hurt, don't bring abuse in your home. And here's the thing. The winning home is a starting point for building a healthy and peaceful society. The winning home is a starting point for building a healthy and peaceful society. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 to 5, it says, Through wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with pleasantries. Now, with this, my question is, is your home a winning home? Now, I'm not asking that to disparage anyone. But you see, we need, this is a call to action. We're fighting the war up front, but we need to look at what's coming up from the inside of the house. It's a call to action to evaluate our own homes, to evaluate our own selves, including myself, to look at the nuances in our lives and say, am I winning? Is my home winning? Am I learning more? Am I living in the winning home? What kind of home is my home today? Or am I creating a winning home? Say to your neighbor, there's hope. See, the Bible says two are better than one. And at the back, at the end of the scripture, I believe in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, 10 or so, at the end of the scripture, the Bible then says, see, a three-foot cord cannot be easily broken. A winning home is one that no matter, it starts with the parents and then it's got God in the center. We just talk about the word of God and God. It says, we're two or three gathered there I am in the midst. If we know that he's got God in the center, then we need to turn. If God has not been here today, then you and I need to repent and bring him in. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Let's see what the word of God says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Hallelujah. I want us to read it together because this is a time for us to really have a deep understanding, deep, deep, deep thoughts, and look at our lives and say, Am I creating a winning home? If you say, I don't know how to do it, Pastor, I, I've tried, I fill out everything, I don't even know how to do it. And that's why I say that God says, I want, I want to help you. And it says it clearly in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Can we read it together? One, two, go. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him 
and down with him and him with me. God says, I want to make a wedding home with you. You don't have to do it alone. What happens when you're done? You talk about things, you, you learn, you share stories, you share experiences. God is asking, he wants to be in our homes. He wants to help us grow. So I'm going to ask every one of us to just bow down our heads for a moment here. You've heard what a winning home is. Now yours may be a perfect home and I understand and I, I respect that. If yours is a perfect home, then all you have to do is, Lord God, I, I thank you for making it even better. If you know that you're a winning home, now let me say this, the winning home is not designed for a few, but for all of us. And we need to attain it because that's what God wants us to do. Now, I want you to understand that I didn't say it's a perfect home because there's no such perfect home. It's not a perfect church. There's never a perfect church. It is a winning home. It's about winning. When you know what you need to do to win, you always win. So we need to make a home the winning home. So I want us to, first of all, if you know that your home is not where God has called it with what you've learned today in His Word. I want you to say, ask for His mercy. I want you to ask for His forgiveness and, and just invite Him into your home. Now you've invited Him into your heart. Well, let me say this, if you have never invited God into your heart, this is another opportunity. I want you to just say, Lord God, I am sorry for my sins. I ask that you forgive me. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my home to take absolute control as I surrender to you. Now those of us who are already born again, you've already invited him to your heart. Now invite him into your home. It says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I want you to just let him know, Lord, I open my door to you, the door of my home. I've tried in my way and I've failed many times. Now I'm inviting you, I call her, I'm inviting you into my home to allow me to win, to help me understand my blind spots, to walk through me, to walk through my children, to walk through my wife, that everyone who comes from outside and when they come inside would see you, not us. Help me learn to know how to agree, how to speak, how to make it a place where I want everyone to be. Help me learn to put you at the center that all decisions will be yours. I look forward to having this home, Lord. Thank you for giving me this opportunity today. I invite you, my home today with you inside is now a winning home. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. How the church say, God bless you.